You see, when H.R. Geiger created the concept art for the xenomorphs, or maybe when he first dreamed up the species, he probably didn't think that these beasts would serve any purpose apart from killing people. I mean, they're not characters like Freddy Krueger or Michael Myers or Dracula or Frankenstein. The xenomorphs are monsters that kill to live and live to kill. You couldn't possibly come across deleted scenes that show them ordering pizza or picking up a football. And despite their extensive presence throughout the franchise, these creatures remain shrouded in mystery, with many unanswered questions lingering in their wake. Many fans believe that these mysteries and questions should be left alone, but the questions are questions, and I thought we should get to the bottom of things. In this video, we will explore the top 9 biggest mysteries surrounding the Xenomorphs, and delve into the various theories and speculations that attempt to shed light on their secrets. So buckle up and prepare to embark on a journey through the unknown depths of one of the most terrifying species in the galaxy. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Number 1. What is the ultimate purpose of a xenomorph? Xenomorphs didn't have a role other than spreading space horror and extraterrestrial terror, but that changed by the sixth issue of a 2021 comic by Marvel, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, and drawn by Salvador La Roca. It actually gave them a purpose, and oh boy, they seem to have a much greater role in the grand scheme of things. Oh, and by the way, it's safe to assume that the following story is canon. The story revolves around Gabriel Cruz, the only person known to have survived the extraction of a chestburster embryo after being implanted by a facehugger. He's worked as head of security at the Epsilon Orbital Research and Development Station. After retiring from his post, his son Danny infiltrates Epsilon and exposes the truth behind Wayland Utani to the world. But little did they know, the station was overrun by xenomorphs, and Danny and his team were ill prepared for the horrors that awaited them. In a sudden turn of events, Gabriel is tasked with retrieving the alpha specimen from Epsilon to avoid being charged with corporate espionage. Upon reaching Epsilon, Gabriel discovers a scene of utter chaos. Everyone is either dead or impregnated, and the only survivor is Danny's girlfriend and team leader, Iris. Time is running out, and Gabriel must act fast to save his son from being cocooned and face-hugged by the insidious creatures. Furthermore, this issue delves into the psyche of a person who has been implanted with a chestburster embryo. Gabriel Cruz unloads his emotional baggage before his poor son and reveals shocking insights into the xenomorphs. We learn that facehuggers are not just implanting embryos into their hosts. When attached to a host, they become connected to the hive mind of the xenomorphs, and in Gabriel's unconscious state, he witnessed the terrifying extent of this hive mind, seeing the xenomorphs who took down his team, as well as those millions of miles away, including the creators of the xenomorphs themselves. But that's not all. In a stunning revelation, Gabriel describes encountering a humanoid xenomorph he refers to as the Woman in Dark. It's a tidal wave of living nightmares blanketing the universe, folks, and this new information opens up a whole new world of possibilities in the sci-fi genre. In another shocking twist, it turns out that Iris, Danny's girlfriend, was actually a synthetic who had turned against the corporate giant Wayland Utani to join the anti corporate resistance. According to her, the chestburster within Danny had the potential to turn the world into a post organic utopia, or a world without any intelligent life forms. She went on to explain that humans were not the first species to attempt interstellar travel, and that such arrogant species were met with the cleansing fire of the xenomorphs, a race that served as the cosmic balance keepers, preventing any single species from dominating the universe. The comics have provided the xenomorphs with a much larger role than just being deadly parasitic creatures. They are essentially the cosmic test for advanced civilizations, and while humans should maintain a safe distance from them, Wayland yutani continues to act recklessly. This theme was also explored in Ridley Scott's 2012 film Prometheus, and the comics seem to be reinforcing this idea. Iris warns that bringing xenomorphs into the fold of humanity would ultimately lead to the woman in the dark and her xenomorphs becoming the inevitable and unavoidable end of humanity. It seems that the Marvel comics have elevated the xenomorphs to a higher level as the cosmic force that keeps the universe in balance. The notion of xenomorphs being the universe's informal response to exploring races is an intriguing concept that holds a certain logic. As perfect killers, they are the great equalizer, ensuring that any organic life that stumbles upon them meets a brutal demise, regardless of their technology or capabilities. It's a chilling thought to ponder the idea of meeting your end at the hands of these monstrous creatures while traversing the vast expanses of space.
Number 2. What's up with the black goo? What happens if there's a lake filled with it? So, for ease of understanding, I will tackle this question in three different ways. Two of them are based on the movies and the comic Fire and Stone, and the last one is a theory that seems somewhat plausible. Black Goo and the Movies The engineers were technologically very advanced, and at the heart of this technology lies a mysterious black goo, capable of both creating and destroying life. The infamous chemical A03959X.91-15, or as it is affectionately known among cinema enthusiasts, the black goo or pathogen, was basically a virulent mutagenic pathogen, composed of countless minuscule microorganisms, and was possibly created by the engineers. In fact, the movie seemed to hint that the black goo was a living thing, and needed a host to show its true colors but then again, nothing has been confirmed. Designed with a dual purpose, this potent concoction was intended to both create life forms and serve as a biological weapon. According to David, who spent a decade studying the pathogen, its primary purpose is to rid planets of unwanted non-botanical life forms. Sounds like the perfect weapon for a particularly aggressive gardener. But this pathogen doesn't discriminate, it's a bit of a kill or be mutated situation. Incompatible hosts don't stand a chance, and the pathogen will outright kill them. But for those unlucky few who are compatible, things get real interesting. They become mutated into aggressive monsters, aptly named anathema or abominations. And if that wasn't bad enough, they also become hosts for parasitic organisms, which can then impregnate a second host, leading to the creation of a neomorph. It's all quite terrifying, but also fascinating in a twisted sort of way. Take geologist Fifield, for instance. He was exposed to the pathogen and mutated beyond recognition, attacking his own crew members with reckless abandon. This guy was tough as nails too, at least after his infection with the black goo, taking multiple gunshot wounds and even withstanding a flamethrower attack. It took a whole transport vehicle to finally take him down. The pathogen also had an effect on some unsuspecting worms, turning them into hammerpeeds. Not only did they develop acidic blood, but they also had the power of regeneration, an ability typically found in flatworms on Earth. But these hammerpeeds regenerated faster than your average flatworm, they had acidic blood, they had extreme strength, a worm, and more. Talk about an evolutionary upgrade. In one of the film's most shocking scenes, archaeologist Charlie Holloway is infected with the black goo, which was the work of David, leading to a bizarre and gruesome impregnation of his girlfriend, Elizabeth Shaw. Interestingly, Shaw was barren and still managed to conceive. Well, she bore a monstrosity, but she was pregnant nonetheless. The result was a fully formed creature known as a trilobite. So, the black goo also affects the host's reproductive systems, resulting in the birth of predatory hybridized creatures bearing xenomorph-like qualities. David later conducts experiments on Planet 4 to create a variety of neomorph variants, utilizing chemical AO3959X.91-15 to splice them together and create the formidable xenomorphs seen in the film. When Black Goo Transformed the Biology of an Entire Planet One of the most interesting AVP comics that Dark Horse ever released was the Fire and Stone series that spanned multiple franchises and eras, in which the stories continued to take place simultaneously in various locations. After the events of Prometheus, a survey crew reaches LV-223, the moon that took Wayland yutani's life. The team included Francis Lane, an astrobiologist suffering from a deadly disease, and his friendly synthetic, Eldon. The two of them stumbled upon an entire lake filled with not water, but black goo. We saw what just a drop of this goo would do to folks like Holloway. Imagine what an entire lake could do. Being an astrobiologist, Francis was quick to deduce several fascinating things. The black liquid didn't have a genetic makeup, but it had every genetic makeup, something like a pool, all mixed together. While some were unrecognizable, others were terrestrial. Furthermore, the substance wasn't inactive like other liquids, but it was aggressive. It was churning. Francis knew he had made a fascinating discovery, but he was playing with toys he didn't fully understand. In reality, an engineer ship had spilled the black goo on the moon after it crashed there, and while the moon was supposed to be barren, it underwent millions of years of evolution over a period of a few decades. Francis wanted to use the liquid for its regenerative growth qualities, which he believed were way past stem cell farming. Because Francis believed that the heightened aggression and horrific growth could be tamed if run through something like a synthetic, he planned to inject the liquid into Eldon, hoping that it would heighten the healing and beneficial aspects which could grow limbs and cure cancer. Eldon was clearly scared, 
but Francis told him that he would only inject a drop and nothing more. Clearly, he was a lying piece of shit because he emptied the entire syringe into Eldon, which leads to an immediate and violent mutation in Eldon. His veins turn black and soon the black goo reaches his brain. Later, he developed a maw in his abdomen and even infected a predator, turning him into a mutated predator when the abdominal maw bit the predator's hand. In Fire and Stone Omega, we learn that the liquid had changed the topography of the moon and brought the entire place to life to the extent that they witnessed an entire living mountain, complete with veins and everything. A few survivors found themselves inside this mountain with nowhere to go, and as the walls of the living mountain began to merge, Eldon started to merge with the wall and created a hole for the survivors to escape through. So, Eldon merged with the mountain, and by extension, the moon itself. The Natural Evolution Theory One theory suggests that the engineers found the xenomorphs fully evolved and in their current form. However, they saw that these biometallic beasts were the perfect killing machines and wished to harness the xeno power. So, they broke the xenomorphs down to their very DNA and used it to extract the goo, or at least the base material from which the black goo was made. They then used it as an agent to spread beings in their image on other planets or to annihilate other civilizations. If you think about it, both the black liquid and the xenomorphs are living parasites, so it does kind of make sense. Number 3. Exploring the true purpose of the space jockey and their relationship with the xenomorphs. In 1979, director Ridley Scott delivered an iconic film that would redefine the sci-fi horror genre forever. The movie introduced audiences to a creature that would become synonymous with terror, the xenomorph. However, the film's opening scenes revealed something equally intriguing and unsettling, a colossal alien being dubbed the pilot. Fast forward to 2012 and Scott returns to the franchise he created to shed more light on the enigmatic space jockey and the origins of the xenomorphs. Prometheus and its sequel, Alien Covenant, explore the universe in greater detail and shed more light on the pilots, now known as the space jockey or the engineers, weaving together a complex web of mythology that deepens the story's already rich lore. In the original Alien, the Nostromo crew stumbles upon the pilot while investigating a distress signal on LV-426. This strange guy's physical appearance is imposing, with a trunk much like an elephant's and a chest cavity that seemed to have been ripped open from the inside. Furthermore, the crew discovers a chamber filled with egg-like cocoons, one of which hatches and unleashes the facehugger upon unfortunate crew member Kane. Designed by artist H.R. Geiger and brought to life by Ron Cobb, the pilot's imposing presence and mysterious backstory was something that perplexed many. Cobb even provided an expanded backstory for the creature, revealing that it was part of a race of explorers or maybe even archaeologists who first made contact with the xenomorphs before being wiped out by these biometallic monsters. Naturally, with the pilots gone, the xenomorphs found themselves stranded on the planet. However, Ridley Scott had other plans for the franchise's future with his return in Prometheus. With Prometheus, director Ridley Scott set out to explore the origins of the xenomorphs, delving deep into the engineered nature of the franchise's titular creature. The film's opening introduces us to the Engineers, an ancient race of tall, bald, and pale extraterrestrials, responsible for seeding life on countless planets with their advanced genetic engineering technology. So, it can be safely said that they seed planets using the black goo, and that's one of the most significant parts of their job profile. In the movie, we also discover a startling revelation. The engineers and the space jockeys from the original Alien film are one and the same, with the pilot's design revealed to be an exoskeletal battlesuit. The film's final moments reveal the birth of a new creature, the pale and bluish deacon. One look at this creature and it becomes clear who were the genetic ancestors of the Xenon. Five years following the release of Prometheus, Alien Covenant shed further light on the origins of the iconic Xenomorphs. As it turns out, the villainous and genocidal android David was the true architect behind the terrifying creatures. Having arrived on the Engineer homeworld following the events of Prometheus, David saw both humans and engineers as inferior to his own form and proceeded to systematically wipe out the engineer race. In his quest for the perfect organism, David further built on the genetic breakthroughs of the engineers, ultimately engineering the xenomorph in its well-known form. The film's central theme of the Prometheus mythology rings true. Prometheus' story is often seen as a cautionary tale about the consequences of challenging the established order and of acting against the will of the gods, or in this case, nature. David 
paid a price of knowledge, but not at his own cost, and endangered countless humans in the process. However, there's yet another theory that says that the engineers were different from space jockeys or pilots. The trunk and the skull in the original film were not exactly exoskeletons. They were, in fact, real flesh and bone, a part of the pilot's corpse, which was lying naked in there. These colossal beings visited Xenomorph Prime, the homeworld of the infamous Xenomorphs. Their intentions were to either domesticate or cultivate these deadly creatures. Furthermore, there is a possibility that the pilots either enslaved or created the engineers, or they engineered them from a few unfortunate humans, which explains the humanoid appearance of the engineers, how these guys were heavily influenced by the pilots, and even attempted to replicate their suits and technology to resemble that of the pilots. Number 4. The true extent of their adaptability to their host is still a mystery. The most striking element about xenomorphs is their ability to gestate inside just about any organism, and that too with an incredible speed of growth. We know that chestbursters have come out of humans, dogs, and even aliens such as predators and rinth from the planet of Ryushi. While this is somewhat possible in lower microscopic organisms such as bacteria through lateral gene transfer, it's unlikely in higher organisms. Time to dig deeper. There have been many theories about the way a facehugger impregnates its victim, but the currently accepted theory is that a facehugger injects a mutagenic substance called plagiarist prepotens into the victim's esophagus instead of an embryonic xenomorph, which was the previously believed theory. Studies conducted aboard the Cold Forge in the comic by the same name have shed light on the true nature of this substance deposited by facehuggers. This mutagenic fluid is a powerful mimic that is capable of unzipping genetic material at lightning speed and accruing biomass from anything and everything around it. With the requisite chimeric blueprint and enough food, it can transform from a single-celled organism into an adult creature with fully differentiated organs in a matter of hours. It is now understood that plagiarist prepotens is responsible for the creation of a chestburster within the host organism. This substance, when introduced into the host via the mouth, consistently creates a chestburster. But how exactly is this done? Well, things are not canon, I can try my best to give you a gist from the information available available and my own humble insight. The mutagen transforms the host's internal physiology on a molecular and cellular level to give rise to a chestburster. Clearly, the process is fairly complex and involves molecular rearrangement to form new organic compounds. So, carbon molecules are disintegrated and recombined to form the hard skeletal structure of a xenomorph. On the other hand, the hydrogen ions are combined with excess sulfate and nitrate ions to form sulfuric and nitric acids that form the blood of the chestburster. Since the chestburster gestates inside and develops from a host, it takes on several traits of the host by copying 10-15% to of the host's DNA. That's why pred aliens have yaucha mandibles and runner xenomorphs are quadrupedal. As far as the gestation period is concerned, it varies from one host to another, but royal chestbursters take the most amount of time to gestate. However, its potency and reaction to other organic substances are yet to be fully understood. Research done in the comic has shown that the Manumala noxhydria, colloquially known as the facehugger, require their prey to be scared for optimal implantation. Dr. Blue Marsalis noted that the frightened hosts produced better developed embryos. It is important to note that due to the rapid absorption of the mutagenic fluid by the host organism, the process of impregnation becomes lethal and has resulted in numerous failures. However, to ensure that the host does not die because of the lack of breath, the facehugger provides the host with a mix of gases that the host can breathe. Number 5. How are Xenomorph Queens created? The origin of the Xenomorph Queen is a hotly debated topic among fans. But one thing is clear, these creatures are serious about spreading their species. There are theories that multiple methods could create a queen, given the xenomorph's adaptability. Once a queen takes control of a planet, it's nearly impossible to get rid of her. It's interesting to note that a new queen will destroy any eggs, facehuggers, and praetorians she comes across when taking over another hive, but drones and warriors can live to see another day. It's a strange and complex process. Bishop, a synthetic character from the alien novelization, has his own ideas on 
how xenomorph queens are created. He suggests that royal jelly, similar to what creates a honeybee queen, could be the key to creating a xenomorph queen. This would mean that a queen is destined to be a queen from the start of her life cycle. The idea was meant to be confirmed in Alien 3, which initially included a royal facehugger that implanted a special queen embryo into the host, along with a regular embryo into another host. These scenes were later added back into the special edition of the movie. In the theatrical release of Alien 3, we know that Ripley carries a queen embryo, but the film doesn't explain how two embryos came to be when we only see one egg and one regular facehugger. It used to be a bit of a head-scratcher, but we now know that the royal ovomorphs lay two eggs, the queen and a drone to protect her. The queen takes longer to mature, so the drone stays with her until she's ready to lead the hive. Alien 3 gives us a glimpse of the queen chestburster, which has a distinct appearance with a partially developed head crest, well-formed legs, and two pairs of arms. In the Aliens novels and the Alien vs. Predator video games, the queen evolves from lower castes of xenomorphs, such as Praetorians and drones. The games even show a Praetorian evolving into a queen in the final cutscene of the Alien campaign. This concept is further explored in Aliens vs. Predators Prey, where Deshaund notes that drones can transform into females and then molt into queen aliens, creating a new hive. In the xenomorph outbreak in Gunnison, Colorado, we see something entirely different. A Predalien can impregnate humans with multiple xenomorph embryos directly, suggesting that it's a premature queen. This unique impregnation method lets the creature quickly build an army of xenomorphs before she becomes an immobile egg layer. Number 6. Is it at all possible that xenomorphs evolve naturally? Let's explore from a scientific standpoint. If we're talking about the origin of xenomorphs, there can be only two possibilities. They either evolved through constant mutation owing to ecological and environmental stimuli, or someone cooked them up to create the most ferocious and near-perfect killing machine ever recorded. Unlike the predators or any other creature from any universe, xenomorphs are the perfect killers. However unlikely as it may seem, it is possible xenomorphs were the result of natural processes with no outside influence of a higher and more intelligent race. But the fact remains that xenomorphs have the capacity to become the apex predator of the world they find themselves on and can destroy all other life forms, including themselves, once the food sources were completely exhausted and exploited. But this raises another important question. Why would Mother Nature create such a monster that decimates herself until only the monster is left alive? Furthermore, the films have heavily implied that the xenomorphs were basically the work of engineers, and the work was accelerated and twisted by the meddling of David from Ridley Scott's later movies, who wanted to create the perfect organism that would outdo every other. So that leaves us with the other possibility. Someone experimented with an alien species to make the xenomorphs what they are today, because no reasonable natural environment would lead to the evolution of such a species. From a scientific standpoint, the strongest argument for this is that it is impossible for one organism to take over the genes of creatures from entire entirely different biomes and planets, especially in higher organisms. Furthermore, such a mutation would not develop naturally, as mutations are usually a response to biological and natural forces. But the xenomorphs are able to achieve this feat and present their protein structure and genetic material as extremely malleable. This cannot happen unless their biology was tampered with on a cellular level because of some form of augmentation or technological manipulation. So the only reasonable explanation is that a higher intelligence doctored the xenomorph DNA so that its offspring can gestate within organisms from widely different gene structures and from different planets, while maintaining that such offspring bear similarities with their kind while also retaining certain traits of the host species which would help them survive on the host's planet. How else could a pred-alien coordinate with other aliens, and that too through telepathy, so much so that all of them are more than willing to sacrifice themselves for a queen? You see, having this many abilities in a single organism would go against the concept of natural balance. I mean, in a world where there is nothing but plants, nature wouldn't thrive to its potential. And who knows, maybe the Xenos would start going after plants when all other food sources were exhausted. Number 7. How intelligent are the Xenomorphs? Ridley Scott planned an alternate ending in which the Xenomorph in his original film was supposed to kill Ripley, after which it would have contacted Earth in Ripley's voice, telling humans that she was coming back home. We certainly dodged a bullet there. But what's important to note is that the makers still thought that Xenomorphs are capable of doing a lot more than their job profile suggests. Furthermore, according to the research of Dr. Paul Church, a demented scientist from Aliens Labyrinth, the surface of the head was lined with 
compound cells of fullerite encased in herlantium. The internal structure was composed of solid neurons in two binary fans. This enabled the creature to receive brain waves and to assess another animal's characteristics by seeing the animal's body. Additionally, strong fields of electromagnetic waves would give the creature the xenomorph version of a brain freeze. Church's research has also shown that the xenomorphs do not live long in captivity. Having said that, these bad boys have been wreaking havoc on human populations in the Alien franchise for quite some time now. And while they're known for their hunting skills and their ferocity, the real question is how smart are they? Well, some people think they're more intelligent than we give them credit for. Take for example their ability to mess with human technology. These guys can knock out electrical systems, leaving us humans in the dark and at their mercy. That's some pretty clever thinking for a feral beast if you ask me. I mean, I would expect such things from the raptors in the Jurassic Park franchise, but Xenos seem to outsmart even them. But it doesn't stop there. In the incidents at Hadley's Hope and the USM Auriga, the Xenomorphs showed some impressive problem-solving skills. They figured out how to operate machinery and even learned how to solve problems in a mechanized environment. Talk about being adaptable. And let's not forget about their strategic thinking abilities. The Queen, in particular, seems to possess some serious smarts. She chose to set up her nest at the colony's atmosphere processing plant, recognizing that it would afford her some protection. Or maybe she just wanted to be warm and cozy. Who knows? Furthermore, the intelligence of Xenomorphs may also be influenced by the host in which they gestate. For example, a Predalien was observed tearing a skull from a human corpse as a trophy, matching the common behavior of the Yaucha creatures from which it was spawned. However, Xenomorphs do not exhibit much emotion, except for basic self-preservation and protective instincts towards their eggs and the queen. But what about communication? Well, it's hard to say for sure. They can make a range of hissing and screeching noises, but most of their communication is probably done through pheromones or ultrasound. Or, as some comics suggest, they make use of the more basic means such as vibrations and electricity. And some experts even believe they're bioelectrically networked in a hive consciousness. Now that is pretty wild. Imagine if all the billions of mosquitoes on Earth had a hive mind and woke up one day to exterminate humans. Where would we go? That does kind of sound like the plot of a cult classic B-movie. But perhaps the most fascinating thing about these creatures is their ability to inherit memories genetically. That means they basically have access to millions of years of memories, all passed down from generation to generation. And these memories go beyond just basic instincts. They can include specific events witnessed by earlier generations. That's some serious learning potential right there. All in all, the Xenomorphs may be more intelligent than we give them credit for. And while they may not show much emotion beyond self-preservation and protection of their eggs and queen, they are certainly capable of learning and problem solving. Number 8. What is the average lifespan of a xenomorph? To be perfectly honest, we can only guess and speculate the true lifespan of a xenomorph because there has hardly been a reliable source that has said that a xenomorph died of old age. Still, let's do our best to answer this question as comprehensively as possible. An organism's lifespan is a crucial factor that is determined by a complex interplay between its environment and personal biology. The environment plays a significant role in determining the lifespan of an organism, as it influences various aspects of its life, such as access to resources, predation, and disease. For instance, organisms living in less stressful environments with abundant resources tend to have longer lifespans, as they have access to a sufficient supply of food and water. Personal biology also plays a crucial role in the determination of lifespan. Genetic factors, such as the presence of certain genes that promote longevity, can significantly increase an organism's lifespan. Additionally, physiological factors, such as an organism's ability to repair cellular damage and resist diseases can also impact its lifespan. Furthermore, the relationship between an organism's environment and its personal biology is bi-directional. For example, in response to environmental stressors such as high temperatures, some organisms may develop heat shock proteins that help protect them from heat-induced damage. Such adaptations can extend an organism's lifespan in a particular environment. But why am I talking about all of this and not dear Xenos? Well, the bad boys are well equipped with numerous features that allow them to have an exceptionally long life lifespan. The queen is, like, super durable, and we know that from the Alien vs. Predator franchise. While humans would consider it harsh and hostile, the xenomorph queen practically chills in there for more than a thousand years and comes out all healthy and wild. In the ovomorph form, the xenomorphs can sustain at least a century, if not more. So you see, although a xenomorph may seem biometallic, its body is partly made of a highly elastic and durable polymer, which even shields it from its own blood. Furthermore, they got these 
awesome defensive weapons and the sharp mind of the galaxy's most skilled hunter to control these weapons. In some manners, they represent the terrestrial virus, which are creatures that come with a lot of defense mechanisms to help them sustain longer. Number 9. We are never told about the true extent of their hive mind. The xenomorphs are undoubtedly one of the most fascinating and terrifying creatures in science fiction. One aspect that adds to their intrigue is their hive mind, or collective consciousness. While the extent of their hive mind is never fully explained in the movies, it is clear that they possess a highly evolved system of communication and coordination. Eusociality, or the concept of a hive mind, is the cornerstone of the xenomorph's social structure. Like the utopian eusocial organism, xenomorph Morphs function as a superorganism, with a single mind controlling multiple bodies, and all these bodies are dedicated to a singular objective. There are no rogues or defiance, and although the true extent of their hive mind is not well understood, one of the comics spoke about an entire civil war between the red xenomorphs and the black xenomorphs, and it was in this comic that we learned that the queen mother of Xenomorph Prime, basically the supreme leader of all xenomorphs in the universe, could send telepathic signals to her kind who were tens of thousands of light years away. Furthermore, she could even impact the dreams of humans. That's like saying Freddy Krueger had a super major upgrade. Nevertheless, it is believed that the genetic species from which xenomorphs evolved, or the intelligent alien species that created xenomorphs, gave them genetic memory to be passed down through generations. This inherited knowledge likely plays a role in the xenomorphs' ability to adapt to new environments and hosts. One fascinating aspect of the xenomorphs' hive mind is the variety of communication methods they employ. Some colonies rely primarily on pheromones to convey information to nestmates and outsiders. Others are telepathic, demonstrating greater cohesiveness and intelligence as a result. And still others use a complex language that combines elements of both pheromone communication and telepathy, and even includes body language to convey abstract concepts. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the xenomorph's hive mind is the degree to which individual xenomorphs can develop their own personalities and idiosyncrasies. As they adapt to new hosts and environments, they acquire genetic memory and develop unique traits. This suggests that the xenomorph's hive mind is not monolithic, but rather a dynamic and ever-evolving entity that is shaped by the experiences of its individual members. So basically, the xenomorph's hive mind is a complex and multifaceted system that is both fascinating and terrifying. While we may never fully understand the extent of their collective consciousness, it is clear that they possess a highly evolved communication and coordination system that allows them to function as a superorganism. Whether communicating through pheromones, telepathy, or a combination of both, the Xenomorph's hive mind is a testament to the power of collective intelligence. Marvelous Verdict in conclusion, while the unsolved mysteries surrounding the Xenomorphs may frustrate some fans, they ultimately add to the richness and longevity of the franchise. These unanswered questions provide endless fodder for fan theories, discussions, and debates, keeping the community engaged and active. They also allow for a level of intrigue and mystery that keeps viewers on the edge of their seats, wondering what will come next. So, whether it's the origin of the Xenomorphs, their complex biology, or their seemingly supernatural abilities, these mysteries have become an integral part of the alien universe, and they will undoubtedly continue to captivate and inspire audiences for years to come. It's all mysterious and ominous, which makes it even more frightening. And you know what would be really awesome? Is if they didn't try to over-explain everything with some ridiculous prequel about engineers that also tries to commercialize the Xenos. That would just ruin the entire vibe. Sometimes it's better to let the audience use their own imagination instead of spelling everything out and ruining the franchise's mystique by over-explaining. It. That's all for this video, but thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.